Excuse me, everyone. Uh, this is a long program, or at least a very complex program. Uh, so I would like to get us started. I'm Jonathan Brent. I'm the executive director of the Evo Institute, and I welcome all of you. It's, um, it's such a tremendous pleasure to see so much of the Evo community come together here and in recognition of this uh, and, and with the full understanding that we're all here tonight really to honor David Fishman and the publication of his new book, The Book Smugglers, but we're also here to honor those in Vilna in 1940, 41, 42, 43, who risked their lives, who gave their lives for the saving of what they thought to be their culture, the vast collection of priceless books and documents that are stored here at the Evo Institute and in other locations around the world. But I'd like to begin by recognizing uh, a couple members of our board who are here, um, without whom none of this would be possible. And uh, the first person I'd like to recognize is Irene Pletka, our vice chairman. Irene. And the second person I would like to recognize is Rosina Abramson. Where are you, Rosina? Stand up. But then I also want to recognize um, Sam Norwich, who is here, who was the director of the Evo Institute when the first, uh, when, when the first announcement from Vilnius came. Uh, that materials had been found in 1988, I believe it was. Um, and I want to recognize Mira Van Doren. Mira, who was one of the earliest uh, to begin chronicling the history of Vilna, who did extraordinary interviews uh, and has an immense library of uh, memories and, and discussions with many of the original actors, uh, many of the people who took part in this extraordinary story that we're going to hear about this evening and which, um, which David has written about so beautifully. Um, David told me that either his publisher or his agent might be here. Is that true or false? Ah! You must stand up. As a former publisher myself, I know how important this is. <laughs> everybody, everybody is important. It seems to me that at bottom, that is one of the fundamental uh, 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 messages of David's book, which is everybody is important. Everybody is important in the making of culture, in the saving of culture. And, and, and though this book is filled with heroes, it is, a, it is a story about a great communal effort to save culture, a communal effort that spanned, indeed, Hermann Kruk and Zilek Kalmanovich and Avram Sutskever and Katja Ginsky and, and uh, Rachel Krinsky but it also includes the Poles and the Lithuanians who helped, the ordinary people who, who, who facilitated. All of that is important. Not one part of that can be left out of this story. And uh, with uh, some cognizance of that importance, I want to recognize our co-sponsors for this evening, without whom this could not be made. Uh, have, have been possible. The, the uh, National Yiddish Book Center, uh, Aaron Lansky, uh, who is the director, who will be speaking, and the Jewish Theological Sem uh, Seminary. 
Uh, before I go on, uh, and I will try to be extremely brief, uh, I, I have a couple additional notes. One is that there is an exhibition from the YIVO archives of our photo, from our photographic collection of, uh, of Vilna and specifically relating to the, um, uh, to the paper brigade and the saving of our books and documents. And this is to be found on the third floor in the Smart Gallery. Some of you know where that is. The vast majority of you do not. Uh, I ask uh, Alex Weiser. Alex, are you here? Alex is in the back. He's that, that, that big guy back there with the, with the blonde hair. Uh, and he is going to be standing by the elevator helping to direct you to the third floor smart gallery. It is an extraordinary, extraordinary exhibit uh, that was uh, uh, curated by Eddie Portnoy and executed by Alex Brandwine. There is a reception afterwards. You may have noticed it, and I'm very pleased to say that all the food was not eaten before the program. Um, and afterwards, there is a book signing. Uh, uh, David will sign his book, and you will pay $36. And you might be moved to pay a bit more and make a donation to the Evo Institute through that means. Uh, and we would be immensely grateful for that gesture of support. Now, I'm going to say a few words about, about Evo today. And I will let our other speakers talk about Evo and Vilna in the past. Um, the first thing I want to say in connecting what we're doing today to David's book is that he quotes Hermann Crook at one point, uh, speaking about the miracle of the book in the ghetto. The miracle of the book. The book has a place in the ghetto that no one could have anticipated. The library that Herman Crook oversaw was used by hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. It was an inspiration. And these books that were saved have become an inspiration to us today. It's a bridge. These books are not just books. And this is what is so confusing to so many people who don't know what Evo is. But these documents are not just documents. They are more than just historical artifacts. They are, in fact, a bridge, a historical bridge, a, 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 a focus of continuity to our past. And without these documents, without these books, that past would have been almost unknowable by us. It is like an umbilical cord in a way. And so they have a sort of extraordinary place here at the Evo Institute. We have 23 million documents. The Vilna collection is about 750,000. So it's small, but it is the core it is the heart and the soul of this institute. It is what has spirited this institute forward since 1940, since when Max Weinreich got here in 1940. Many of the, of the individuals that, that uh, David writes about in his book were concerned about what he calls the physical, and many have called the physical extermination of an entire culture. And that's true. That's what the Nazis aspired to do. They didn't want simply to exterminate people. They wanted to exterminate Jewish culture. And so the saving of these books was an act of defiance. It was an act of incredible heroic resistance. But what does it mean to save culture? Is a book culture? Is a document culture? What is that? We use these words so glibly and they've become such shibboleths. 
And half the time we have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about quote unquote culture. And that's something that I think about all the time as we here at YIVO are undertaking what we now call the Edward Blank Vilna Collections Project. <clears throat> what are we doing this for? What's the point? Who cares? You've got a big warehouse full of books. So what? You have a big warehouse full of documents. So what? They came from Vilna. Some people have nostalgic feelings about it. So what? And an English historian once said to me that when he was grading his uh, students' papers, he would often pose the so what question to them. So what are all these facts all about? What do they add up to? Why do I have to take them seriously? What are they for? Sutzkever thought that every book he hid in Vilna was like a, a grain of wheat that he was planting that would eventually grow again and bear fruit. Kalmanovich thought that perhaps there will be Jews in Vilna after the war, but no one will write Jewish books here ever again. So what were they doing this for? For whom? For the non-Jews who would be there? They were doing it ultimately when they found out that Ivo had survived, that Max Weinreich had gotten to America, and that, uh, that Ivo in the United States had uh, uh, become the legal successor to Ivo in Vilna. There was a celebration. Maybe there would be a ray of hope for the future of that world, which they saw somehow crystallized in these books and documents. A ray of hope that people somehow, somewhere on the other side of the world would understand this, would get this, that there would be a remnant left who could understand the depth, the breadth, the soaring heights that these documents represented of the Jewish culture that was being destroyed by the Nazis. But most of them didn't live to see it. Sutzkever and Katriginsky did, but Kalmanovich and Hermann Kruk and so many others did not. That remnant, a lot of it is right here in this auditorium now. The remnant is also individuals who have come through the EVO educational programs over the years and are now heads of Jewish studies departments all over the world. The remnant of it is the rebirth of Jewish studies in Poland. The remnant of it is the Lithuanians who now are excited by these documents that we are digitizing and making available in Lithuania they are excited to find out what this history was. And they see it not as the history of the Jews, but as the history of Lithuania, the history of that world. And so maybe there is a ray of hope. Maybe there is a thought that these materials can be transformed into knowledge, that these, tra that these materials can somehow be transformed into thinking about our world in a different way. And to do that, to accomplish this, in 2015, we launched here at the YIVO Institute what we call the Edward Blank YIVO Vilna Collections Project. And it is essentially digitally to reunite the materials in Vilna with the materials that we have here to create a coherent base of documents. To digitize not only documents, but to digitize books. And all together with what's in Lithuania and what's here, it's about a million point two pages of documents and about 11,700 volumes. 
I'm glad to say it's a seven-year project, and we're about 82% of the way through with the books, and we're about, Robbie, you will correct me, close to 40% with the documents, maybe not quite. But we're making a lot of progress, and in three weeks, we're going to, we're going to launch the web portal where these materials are going to be put. And so people all around the world, the rest of that remnant that is in Cape Town, or in London, or in Tokyo, or in Buenos Aires, the rest of that remnant will, for the first time since the destruction of Jewish life in Lithuania, have access to their own history. Being cut off from your own history is like losing your shadow. And that's what this project is attempting to do. But it isn't, it turns out, just a normal project where you have a set of materials and you digitize them and you're done. It's not that. As we've gone further in, in, in creating trust and partnership in Lithuania, Lithuanians have come forward with new materials. And so an institution we had never heard of, the Wroblewski Library, has come forward with 8,000 additional new documents that we are incorporating into this project. New books are being found in the National Library. And there are rumors that there are other materials elsewhere that we eventually will be able to process and digitize and conserve and make available. But what does it mean to make them available? I know that most of the people in this room probably can speak or read Yiddish, but most of American Jews can't. They just cannot. And so putting Yiddish documents on the internet and pretending that you've thereby accomplished something is not enough. And the, the next stage of this process is going to be to make selections of documents, to have scholars like David Fishman and others come and, 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 and uh, explain them, put them in context, create galleries, so that people can understand what this life was, that people can understand the extraordinary complexity of it, the way it worked, the way it acted, because culture is not a thing. It's not a building, it's not a place, it's not an object, it's an activity. It's a living activity. And unless you understand that living activity, you cannot understand the culture, and that's precisely what these documents give us. That's why they're so important. Not because among them there is a Balfour document or a declaration of war or some other fantastically important uh, uh, thing of world consequence, but because as a totality they show us how people lived. We hope eventually to produce educational programs out of this and we're in discussion with the Lithuanian authorities on a long-term loan of these materials so that they can come to the United States and we can take them on tour to Chicago and Washington and California and elsewhere. So I know I've talked way too long already and I apologize for that. But those of you who are interested in this, this continuing activity of the YIVO Institute in the, the uh, uh, preserving and digitization and eventually the dissemination of all of these materials, please see me, see Robbie Newman, see Alex, send us a note, and send us a check. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now I want to introduce our, our speakers uh, for this evening, and our first speaker is going to be Aaron Lansky, who is founder, president, and visionary, emphasis on that, of the, Yiddish, na the National Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, 
which has collected and rescued more than a million Yiddish books. Under his leadership, the center has digitized more than 11,000 titles, and I know that we're working together on, on that project uh, with Aaron, which are freely accessible online in the Steven Spielberg Digital Yiddish Library. Among the Yiddish Book Center's new initiatives are a Yiddish audio uh, library of lectures and interviews, the Wexler Oral History Project, the Yiddish Translation Fellowship, and a new multimedia Yiddish textbook. Aaron. Well, shalom Aleichem. <laughs> Ten years ago, my friend Sam Cassow published a book called Who Will Write Our History? about the Oinik Shabbos archive, an underground attempt to chronicle daily life in the Warsaw Ghetto. And after I read that very large book, I had one question that I couldn't quite understand. And it was that after the war, there were only three survivors of the 60 writers of Oinik Shabbos. One of them, Rocha Oyabach, knew where, more or less, these caches were hidden. And she went out and she tried to get Jews to start digging, get survivors to start digging. She went out every day prevailing on people to start digging. Yet it took a year and a half before they finally sunk mine shafts through the rubble and began looking for these precious materials. And I wondered, why in the world did it take so long? And after reading David Fishman's extraordinary book, I have to tell you I had a similar question. I had heard fragments of this story over the years, but all I could think was, why did it take 72 years for the full story finally to be told? I think the answer lies in part in changing notions of Jewish resistance and what it means. In 1963, Hannah Arendt famously said there had been no resistance, and Jews went like sheep to the slaughter. Later, we learned that, of course, there was resistance everywhere, in the ghettos, uh, uprisings in the camps, tens of thousands of Jewish partisans fighting in the forests. But David Fishman now tells us a story of resistance of a very different sort. Those who risk their lives to save, well, paper. Uh, he describes how people in the ghetto used to mock the intellectuals, the librarians, the scholars, the poets, they would say, why are you smuggling paper when we desperately need food? The term the paper brigade was originally a term of derision. But of course, the 20 intellectuals pressed into service were doing much more than just smuggling paper. As Jonathan suggested, they were resisting in a profound way by saving a literature, by saving a culture, by saving a history upon which they knew the Jewish future would eventually depend. David Fishman is a meticulous historian, but I think you'll agree this book is something more than just a work of history. I think you'll agree that it also rises to the level of literature. It's literature because of the color and heroism of its unbelievable protagonists, Shmerka Kaczyginski, Avram Sutskova, Rachel Akrinsky, Hermann Kruk, Zelig Kalmanovich, and so many others. And it's literature because David has a keen eye for anecdote and detail. So what I thought I would do in my very brief time this, time this evening is tell just a few of the stories that struck me most forcibly from the book, since they underscore the depth of the commitment of the members of the Paper Brigade. I want to start with Hermann Crook. He, of course, was the head of the largest Jewish library in Warsaw. In 1939, after the Nazi invasion, he left his family and he fled to Vilna. Uh, after a long and harrowing journey, he arrived in the city. And what was the very first thing he did? He rushed to the Strashwin Library to make sure things were okay. And then he rushed to the Yivo to see if things were okay there. And as David writes, only afterward did he find a place to live and a change of fresh clothes. When the Germans began bombing Vilna in June 22, 1941, Neuch Prelutsky's first instinct was not to seek shelter. Instead, he ran out of the house and ran to the Yivo on the outskirts of town uh, to make sure he buried documents, particularly documents which were uh, testimonies of the Nazi atrocities before the German troops arrived. 
Jonathan mentioned the Jewish library flourished in the ghetto. In 1949, when the Nazis were deporting Jews every day to Panar, circulation reached 325 books a day. Shmirka Kaczyginski, the bard of the Vilna and the life of the party, as David calls him, became a master smuggler. An avowed communist, he strapped books and manuscripts to his body, including sforum and religious objects. And day after day, he risked his life to smuggle them into the ghetto. I love what David wrote. He said, books had rescued him from a life of crime and despair. The least he could do was return the favor. <laughs> Avram Sutskever, the great apolitical poet, distinguished himself as a man of action. He once asked his Nazi overseers for permission to bring waste paper back to his house in the ghetto to burn in his stove, and they agreed. Imagine the courage it must have taken him to carry that paper with him through the checkpoint, and um, the guards fortunately waved him through. What was in the waste paper he was taking supposedly to burn? The waste paper included letters and manuscripts by Tolstoy, Gorky, Sholem Aleichem, and Bialik, original drawings by Chagall, and a manuscript by the Bill Gaon. You must all know, this is not the right place to ask this question, you must all know uh, Sitzkever's poem, the, the, the lead plates of the Ram Drukarai of the Ram Publishing House. The Ram Publishing was the place where they published the Vilna Shas, the great Vilna edition of the Talmud. And Sitzkever wrote a poem in which he talks about how the f ghetto fighters went into the Ram Publishing House and they melted down the plates of the Shas uh, in order to pour the letters, he says, to pour the words into molds to make bullets for armed resistance. It's one of the most beautiful and powerful poems in Yiddish literature. I had always been told that it was largely, a, it hadn't actually happened, and that it was a metaphorical story. But I learned from this book that the wrong plates were melted down, 60 tons of them, but melted down not by Jews, but by the Nazis. And they used the lead to make armaments. But that doesn't mean that Sutzkever got it wrong. As David goes on to tell us, Jewish fighters did in fact melt metal for weapons. Not the words of the Talmud per se, but the silver and gold kiddush cups and the yad that you use to read the Torah with and other ritual objects, they melted them down and then used the precious metal to trade for guns and grenades on the black market. In the end, the paper brigade and the FPO, the resistance movement, actually joined forces. The books that Sutzkever and others helped to save were stacked alongside crates of guns in a ghetto bunker. One last story, and that's about Hermann Crook, who was a natural leader. He wrote in his remarkable diary, which has since been published, he wrote in that diary almost every day. After the ghetto was liquidated and he was shipped to a work camp, uh, under brutal conditions, he continued to write. His last entry, he wrote, we will find the rescued books when we return as free human beings. He never returned. Uh, he died in an especially brutal work camp on September 18, 1944, exactly one day before the arrival of the Red Army. But his prophecy came true. The last chapters of David's book describe the excavation and reclamation of the buried books and manuscripts after the war, including, I'm very happy to say, Crook's own diary, which was found in various places. David describes the ingenuity of Schmerker and Sutzkever and Abakovner in smuggling the same books all over again, this time trying to get them away from the Soviets. He tells of Max Weinreich's diplomacy and persistence in retrieving a vast trove of materials from the Offenbach repository. He tells of the discovery of Yivo's lost treasures in the book chamber uh, in Vilna, in a former monastery where they had been safeguarded by a righteous Lithuanian librarian. He tells, David tells of the indefatigable work of Sam Norwich, Jonathan Brent, and others to negotiate their return, and finally to copy and return them to Yivo in digital form. There's one thing I think we all know for certain, and that is that they will always be Hamans in the world. There'll always be those who hate Jews. There will always be those who want to ban books. There are always going to be people who want to destroy all that is wise and good. But there's an answer to it as well. Crook's diary survived because he meticulously hid three copies of it, and one was found. 
I'm happy to say to build on what Jonathan said, that we're now working with YIVO and the, National, the New York Public Library and the National Library of Israel to do the same thing, to make copies on a much, much larger scale by creating what we're calling a universal Yiddish library, pooling online, online resources to place essentially an infinite number of copies of virtually every Yiddish books in the hands or at the fingertips of every computer user on the planet where they can never be burned or shredded or threatened again. I want to end on a personal note of thanks, and that's to speak to David directly and tell you that I love the book. I, I really loved it. I spent two days of sukkahs reading it nonstop, and I, 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 I was so riveted by the story. Uh, David has told the story that I think would otherwise have been forgotten. And Dovin, in that, in a very real sense, I believe that you're the one who completed the work of the paper brigade. Most of the members of the brigade never knew you, but I leave, believe that all of them would have been immensely proud of you and what you have done and grateful to. The Book Smugglers is a book that will be read and reread as long as Jewish books and readers endure. And for that reason, David, I want to say Yasha Koyach. I thank you and congratulate you with all my heart. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a very, very special pleasure uh, now to welcome Alex Wall, who is uh, an author and journalist in Berkeley, California. She is a contributing editor to uh, J, the Jewish News of Northern California, and also a personal chef and food writer. But for us this evening, Alex is the, great, uh, the granddaughter of Rachela Krinsky Melizen one of the heroes of the Paper Brigade and a central figure in the book Smugglers. There are Paper Brigade descendants across the globe. Shmerki Katraginsky's daughter uh, Liliana lives in Spain. Avram Sutzkever's daughters live in Tel Aviv. Zeli Kalmanovich's grandson lives in Kibbutz Merhavia in Israel. Only Herman Crook did not have descendants. He, his wife, and only son all perished, so we are very privileged to have Alex speak on behalf of the families of the Paper Brigade. It's an honor to be here in such esteemed company. I know I'm here because of my yichas alone, and for that I'm very grateful for this, this opportunity. Um, thank you so much, David and Yivo, for inviting me to join you. I'm gonna start by sharing a bit about my own life that may seem completely irrelevant to why we're here, but I ask that you stick with me. There is a point to this. This past summer, I had an incredibly humbling moment as a journalist. Nigel Walker was a pioneer of organic farming in the San Francisco Bay Area where I live, and he died this past July of cancer at only 56 years of age. As a member of his CSA for the past 12 years, meaning that he's been feeding my husband and me for all that time with his beautiful heirloom organic produce and free range eggs, it was my great honor to be able to pay him a final tribute by writing his obituary for a popular food blog to which I contribute. At the celebration of his life that followed, I was introduced to his parents by his widow as the one who had written that wonderful obituary. Nigel's father, a British man in his 80s, put his hands on my shoulders and told me, I don't know how to thank you enough. You really put our son Nigel on the map. I told him that I hadn't done anything. It was Nigel himself who put himself on the map, and he earned the respect of so many in the Bay Area's food community, and that it was just my honor to bring his story to a much wider audience. I share this little glimpse of my life with you, both because it gives you a small window into who I am, but more so because I see a very strong corollary with the publication of this book, yet on a much grander scale, of course. <laughs> Yiddish and Yiddish culture were extremely important to my grandmother. Um, later in the States, she went by Rachela rather than Rochela, so I'm gonna call her that. Uh, Rachela Pupko Krinsky Melezin and her family. She and my grandfather Abraham Melezin endowed a lecture series at Evo in their post-war lives. Her elder brother Chaim Pupko not only was affiliated with the Yiddish journal Die Zunkunft, but he and his wife Manya were also regulars at Evo. And another Pupko sister, Basia, was a Nazi hunter with the World Jewish Congress and also was a regular at Evo. 
Several people, when learning about my family and about Rachela's relationship with Shmerka Katriginsky, have exclaimed to me what yichas I have. Given that I am Rachela's only granddaughter and that neither Chaim and Manya nor Basia had children of their own, I feel like I am re representing them all by being here. Like so many grandchildren and children of survivors, I am both, since my mother Sarah was a hidden child, details about the war and the time my grandmother had to go away seeped into my consciousness at a very young age. No doubt that has left an indelible imprint on me in so many ways, but that's for another talk. The story of the paper brigade and my grandmother's heroic role in saving important Jewish books and artifacts has always been the part of the, my family's Holocaust narrative that we focused on the most. Of course, it's much easier to talk about the heroism displayed by the paper brigade and how during such dark times they coped by writing and reading poetry as opposed to the horrors that later awaited Rachel at Kaiserwald and Stutthof. Rachel always explained her actions this way, that she felt she was already dead, so she had little to lose. Her husband had been killed at Ponar, and she made the decision to give her toddler ta daughter to her nanny, Victoria, to raise. Bixia dyed Sarah's hair blonde, gave her the Polish name of Irina, and took her to mass every day. Before she fled from Vilna, Vixia would occasionally wheel the baby carriage past the Evo building so that Rachela could catch a glimpse of the daughter who had already forgotten her. Once when they risked coming inside, my mother turned to Vixia and said of her own mother, she's a very nice lady, I'm not afraid of her. For many years, I struggled whether I should write something about this family legacy. But I am neither scholar nor historian, and I do not speak Yiddish. It was David's story to write. But uh, I have embarked on my own project around this legacy. And I thank David for allowing me to speak about it for a moment. I am currently at work on a documentary called The Lonely Child about a song that Shmerka Katriginsky wrote about Rachel and Sarah, and in fact is mentioned in the book. And we will be hearing it uh, a few minutes from now. I have teamed up with filmmaker Mark Smolowitz, who I've known since college, and who is also the son of a hidden child from Poland. He's mostly known in the Jewish community as the producer of the groundbreaking documentary, Trembling Before God. In fact, being with you tonight was such an easy decision, not only because my father lives here, and I wanna thank him for inviting so many of his friends, um, <laughs> um, but also because the day after tomorrow I am flying to Warsaw to meet Mark there, as well as a Polish film producer who has shown great interest in our project and is helping us bring the film to the Polish market and with all the production we hope to do in Poland and Vilna next year. We have asked David not only to be an advisor, but to appear on camera as one of our experts about the context in which the song was written. I am mostly interested in how this song, which was quite well known at the time, is being carried into the future. And one of our great goals with this film is not only to trace the path of the song around the world, but to bring it back to Poland and Vilnius to have it performed there again. We are traveling around the world to meet people whose lives have been impacted by the song. I'll only tell you about one of them now because she's the most relevant to us here. We hope to bring an 86-year-old Yiddish singer named Claire Osipov, who lives in Vancouver, to Poland to film her teaching the song to people there. I learned about the existence of Claire just this past April in this very building when I paid a visit to Yivo's music archivist, Lawrence Slamberg, and asked him to play me every version of the song that he knew of. Claire had sung the song many times over the years, and as I learned in a phone call with her, she recorded it two different times. She was so touched to hear from me when I first reached out to her uh, since she told me that she had often wondered about the people in the song and suspected the worst about their fate. I can't help but feel that those of you who are, who are here tonight are a natural audience for the film. So I'd like to tell you about the trailer, which we have a website, lonelychildmovie.com, and you can also like us on Facebook with Lonely Child Movie. And please come talk to me afterward if you'd like to hear more. I have postcards I can give you, and I'll also be speaking about the film at West End Synagogue upon my return from Poland on October 25th at 8 p.m. But in knowing that I was asked to come here and speak specifically on behalf of my grandmother, I really had to think about what she'd want me to say. She's been gone 15 years now. I can't really know. But I knew her very well. I considered us incredibly close. Despite her quirks, and she had them, of course, my grandparents, both she and Abraham Malezin, were superheroes in my estimation, to have survived several concentration camps and death marches and emerged such loving, giving people. I loved them fiercely. One of my 
most frequently told stories about them is that when my grandfather Abraham went back to teaching from chicken farming, he had a colleague from Germany in his department who suddenly needed emergency surgery. His doctors advised this man that he would need to rely on others to help him with his rehabilitation. He couldn't stay alone, and there was no possibility his wife in Germany could join him in such a short time frame. My grandparents were in agreement that he should come home and live with them. This was the 1950s. This man had never before spoken to my grandfather. He didn't have the courage. Um, as a German, we can only imagine how he felt. Why would you do that, he asked them. I was in the Hitler Youth. After everything you've been through, why would you be the first people to invite me into your home? And they said, you were a child. You're not guilty of anything. You are not to blame. I tell that story because Rachela often told me that she wouldn't give Hitler the satisfaction of, allow of allowing him or what she went through to change her personality. If she would have, it would have been like he had won, and she refused to give him that. Knowing my grandmother like I did has given me my own narrative about her, but David's research for this book is truly extraordinary. When I received the galley, one section in particular had me bawling about my grandmother. Let me tell you that it is a beyond strange experience to read things about the woman I knew so well unearthed by someone else. Rachela confessed in letters to Sitzkever that David read in his archive in Israel that she was so broken and depressed after the war, she wasn't sure she would ever be able to find joy in life again. She also doubted that she would be able to be a good mother to Sarah, who was now six years old, and for several months, she didn't even let her own siblings in the U.S. know that she had survived. Sitzkever was the one who notified them. She wasn't sure how to continue living, and so she didn't want them to know in case... Well, you can imagine. <laughs> I now feel that I will have to go put my own hands on these letters with a, uh, with a translator, of course, but I can tell you firsthand that I did see her experience joy, lots of it, and I feel very grateful for that. She never shared all of that with me, all of that difficult stuff, but there were certain aspects about her that I did know extremely well. Given that, I know that all of this attention would make her profoundly uncomfortable, she hated being called a hero whenever that came up. I think as almost any survivor will, t will tell you, it was always this close between who lived and who died and no one was a hero in that situation. Some were just luckier than others. Um, I also know that some of the details about her personal life revealed in the book um, would make her deeply uncomfortable. I won't elaborate on them here, but if you read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's been 15 years since Rachela died, um, but so I just have to say that I am extremely grateful to David for taking on this subject matter. It is my profound hope that by his doing so that the story will be brought to a wider audience. While Katriginsky and Sutskever's names are already well known in the Yiddish-speaking world, I always felt Rachela was left out of the story. Granted, she wasn't a writer or a poet, but also because women's lives and experiences are often much more likely to be deemed less important and not worthy of writing about. I am thankful that her name is entered into the historical record, and at least in this telling of it, she is getting her proper due. And for that, I have David to thank. Thank you. Our next speaker <clears throat> is Tzvi Gittelman. Uh, Tzvi is a professor of political science and Tisch professor of Judaic studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He is dean of scholars in the field of Soviet and post-Soviet Jewry, the author of many books, including A Century of Ambivalence, The Jews of Russia and the Soviet Union, 1881 to the Present, a photographic history which is based on Yivo's photo collections. Uh, Professor Gittelman is currently working on a project regarding the impact of World War II on Soviet Jewry. Speak. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be back at Evo, which I first visited as an undergraduate in 1960 and have visited many times since. Ich will sagen, ein paar Worte auf Jiddisch habe ich mir erlaubt. Es ist für mich ein großer Covid und ein paar Genügen, zu nehmen Anteil in die heutige Simche. 
Der Mechaber, David Fischmann, ist ein Freund, ein Kollege von Asach Jorn. Kurz dem, was er ist ein Koschewer und fruchtbarer Forscher von Misrach europäischen Jüdentum und ein begabter, talentvoller Lehrer, ist David echt ein Gründer von Project Judaica, die erste akademische Lehrenprogramm wegen Judaike auf einem Universitätsniveau in gewesener Sowjetenverband. Ich habe gehabt, es hier zu sein zwischen die ersten Lehrer in ihrem Programm und ich wundere mich ad hajemase, wie David mit seinen größten diplomatischen Fähigkeiten hat durchgeführt die Lehrenprogramm und die sehr wichtige Dokumentationsprogramm von jüdischen Quellen, von jüdischen Mekeres und die alle Archiven von gewesenem Sowjetenverband. Mit Mut, Geduld, Chochme und eine Sache Energie. David hat jahrelang gekämpft für den Widerwuchs von jüdischen Limudim und in derselben Zeit für Zurückbekommen in die Sifreitäre und die Eizres von Jivo, wo seinen Gewinn verhalten, behalten in Sowjetenverband und auf viele noch der Raspad, der Opfallen ist von Sowjetenverband in die neue litwinische Regierung. Bei dieser Gelegenheit ich will, ich, ich will der Mannen, mein Freund Schmuel Norwich, Karl Reins, Jonathan Brent, welche haben in Meschach von Asachjor mit Asachschwierigkeiten gestarrt, erhängen zu bringen, Jivos reiche Jerusche. The story that David Fishman tells in the book Smugglers is at once horrifying, depressing, amazing, and inspiring. Based on impressively wide-ranging research in many archives, supplemented with many interviews, David manages, as he has in all his previous works, to tell a complex story with great clarity in spare and vivid prose. Unlike most of us academics, he read plain and posh it. <laughs> he speaks to all of us. Vilna, during the war, was like many places in Nazi-occupied Europe. Its ghetto served two purposes, which most ghettos shared the exploitation of labor, and the concentration of people, Jews, in one place in order to facilitate the rapid and thorough murder of these people. Now, Vilna was in Poland until the Soviet Union took it over. And as a result, Vilna's Jews were, like most Polish Jews, deported to killing camps such as Treblinka and Majdanek. But like most Soviet Jews, they were also shot en masse near the city in Ponar, Panyerai, Ponare. Vilna was similar in other respects. Jewish resistors in Vilna faced the same conundrum as elsewhere. Should one stay and fight in order to save a few? and perhaps make a statement for history? Or should one flee the ghetto and save the lives of as many as possible? When some of the Jews of Vilna and Jews all over the western peripheries of the Soviet Union and in Poland did manage to flee the ghettos, they encountered the same excruciating problems. More on that in a minute. The Judenrat in Vilna, like others, tried to maneuver between German pressure and Jewish needs and resistance. For example, Yaakov Genz, the head of the Judenrat, who, by the way, could himself have gone over to the Aryan side because he was one of the very few Lithuanian Jews married to a Lithuanian. Jacob Genz, in order to save the entire ghetto as he saw it, ordered the communist Itzik Wittenberg to surrender himself. 
give himself up to the Germans, lest the Germans kill all the inhabitants of the ghetto. Wittenberg, after a hot and heavy discussion in his party cell, complied. But that same Gens is reported to have slipped a cyanide pill to Wittenberg. Wittenberg swallowed it the night before he was to be interrogated by the Gestapo. And as a result, he did not undergo torture and he did not reveal the secrets of the Jewish resistance in the Vilna ghetto. Finally, Vilna's Sheris Hapleter, the surviving remnant of Jews, faced the same psychologically crushing blow after the war as others who came under communist control in the USSR and Eastern Europe. After the war came further repression of Jewish religious and cultural revival and the persecution of those who wished to reclaim any form of Jewish expression. But Vilna was also atypical and unusual, perhaps even unique. Like Warsaw and a very few other ghettos, Vilna's Jews managed to carry on a vigorous cultural life under the most unlikely circumstances. It's the only place I know of where a substantial Jewish cultural treasure trove was saved from the Nazis, not by chance, not by German oversight, and indeed, not by a miracle, but by the actions of heroic people whom David Fishman so beautifully and poignantly describes in his marvelous book. These were cultural fanatics. These were people, can you imagine? Can you imagine this happening in America? People willing to give up their lives to save paper? Of course, it was not just paper that they were saving. If ever Jews deserved the sobriquet of Am HaSefer, the people of the book, Kaczerginski, Sutskeva, Krinsky, Cook, and the others deserved that title. Jews have traditionally distinguished between Sforim, which literally means books, but we reserve that term for holy books, religious books, and Bicher, ordinary books. The people in Vilna made no such distinction. Everything was holy. Bicher became Sforim. This was an attempt which only decades later proved to be successful to preserve an ancient and modern civilization against the efforts of those who would destroy it along with the bearers of that civilization. Fortunately, David Fishman does not confine himself to the story of cultural resistance. Some of the heroes and heroines of the story resisted eventually as partisans. And what did they encounter as partisans? The same shocking problems that other Jewish partisans did. Before 1942, when the Soviet government established a central command of the partisan resistance, the partisan movement on the territories of the former Soviet Union was disorganized, chaotic, subject to the whims of each individual commander, and it was rife with anti-Semitism, with wanton violence, with sexual exploitation. In 42, the Soviets seemingly imposed military discipline on the partisans, coordinated among them, got rid of the deviations that had occurred beforehand, and yet, as late as the fall of 1942, 1943, the escapés from the Vilna ghetto encountered among the partisans open, unapologetic anti-Semitism, rejection, and outright robbery, as David so vividly describes. This forced even pre-war communists, perhaps Kaczerginski among them, to rethink their allegiances. When they discovered that the Soviet slogan of Bratstva Narodov, Druzhba Narodov, the friendship of the peoples, was a myth. 
and that the slogan of proletarian internationalism was but an illusion. The final blow came after the war. Mikhail Suslov, a Russian, high official of the Communist Party, who had overseen the mass deportation of Chechens and other Muslims from their lands during the war, and the deportation of tens of thousands of Lithuanians from their republic after the war, people suspected of nationalism or anti-Sovietism, this Suslov refused to allow any Jewish institution to be reestablished on the soil of Lithuania, although the Jews had begun to do just that. Suslov apparently is a ganz feiner antisemit. <laughs> but be that as it may, he did oppose Nikita Khrushchev's reforms of 1956 and the reforms of the Hungarian and Czechoslovak Communist Party leadership in the 1960s. What happened in Lithuania, therefore, was that Jewish culture was choked off when it had some chance to revive in some form after the catastrophe. Now, why was the Soviet regime, especially after 1948, so intent on implementing or, or rather supplementing the German genocide with a kind of cultural equivalent, a culture side, if there is such a term. There is evidence that as early as 1943, after the Battle of Stalingrad, when the Soviets felt that they would now win the war, that anti-Semitism began to be a state policy filtering down into the Red Army itself. Moreover, the Soviets were at pains to demonstrate that they had fought the costliest war imaginable. 27 million Soviet citizens died during the war. Not for the Jews. Not for the supposed Jido Komuna, the Jewish communist conspiracy, which the Nazis painted as the essence of the Soviet regime. They had fought the war for Stalin, for so socialism, for what they conceived of as a people's democracy. So the Jews could not be portrayed as heroes, as people to be saved, or as people who had suffered any more than anyone else. Specifically in Lithuania, reimposing Soviet rule there, and let's remember that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were dragged into the Soviet Union against the will of their populations in 1940. Reimposing Soviet rule was not easy. There were 30,000 or so Lithuanian forest brothers actively combating the Soviet regime, many of whom had collaborated with the Nazis during the war and saw the Soviet Union as at least as great an evil as Nazi Germany. And the Soviets were involved in a civil war as well in Ukraine, battling the Ukrainian insurgent army, both of these until the early 1950s. And last, the Soviets were intent on suppressing not only these militant nationalisms, but anyone who had ties with the outside world. The Cold War was rapidly descending upon the world. Who more than the Jews represented a people without a country? A people with multiple ties all over the world, and especially in those countries which the Soviet Union came increasingly to perceive as the enemy country namely the United States and the West in general. So this, I think, is the reason that a regime which became increasingly paranoid, and perhaps Stalin himself fell victim to that disease, saw the Jews at best as a people to be tolerated, as a people who 
had benefited from the meritocracy that the USSR was in the 1920s and 30s, but who were now to be relegated to the position of second-class citizens. All of this, on my part, is, of course, speculation. David's book is not. What David Fishman has given us is a fascinating, solidly attested, thrilling story, a memorial to those who put their lives on the line to rescue a culture, our culture. And let me echo Aaron Lansky and say, we owe you a heartfelt yashikeach. Um, what comes next is uh, not a lecture, not a talk. Uh, some wonderful entertainment that will be brought to us by Josh Waletsky, an acclaimed documentary filmmaker, Yiddish songwriter, vocal artist. Uh, Josh uh, uh, has a, an award-winning film, Partisans of Vilna, which first drew worldwide attention for the bravery and Dilemmas of Vilna's Ghetto Fighters. He recently produced four films on contemporary Yiddish writers and two CDs of original Yiddish songs, Arabir de Shotten, uh, Shotten's uh, Crossing the Shadows and Passagieren Passengers. I'd like to introduce Zoe Christensen, who will be accompanying on the harmonic. Uh, I'm going to sing four songs, words by Shmerke Kaczerginski. They were written at the beginning of the, the ghetto. Two were, were written later in the, in, during the war and the last one was written just after the war. They give us a kind of a, of a timeline. The first one, the Jugendhimmel, was dedicated to the, and sung by the Children and Youth Club in the ghetto. It was a very rich organizational life. And there was a club for the youth. Um, and, um, Having uh, heard Aaron's uh, remarks earlier, I just want to remark that the, the texts to the first three songs, I actually got online at the Spielberg collection <laughs> uh, because Kaczerginski's collection of songs from the ghettos and camps uh, is part of the collection. So uh, the preservation of our culture in action the Jugendhimmel. Uh, I'll give a, a, a little for, uh, foreshortened translation. Our song is full of grieving. Bold is our heartening stride. And the rest of the verses follow in that spirit. The refrain, young is everyone who cares to be. Years have no significance. Old people really can be children of a new free age. And anyone familiar with the resistance in the ghetto knows that it was, in fact, the youth that was leading the way. Um, so it's a very interesting lyric from an early period in the ghetto. Young is everyone who cares to be. And the third verse of the four is particularly relevant to tonight. We remember all our enemies, we remember all our friends. We will always think of our yesterday with our today. And that's, of course, what the entire enterprise that David's book treats is about. Thank you. 
Unserwied ist voll mit Treue, dreist ist unser Muntergang. Gott der Seine wacht beim Teuer, Sturm und Jugend mit Gesang. Jung ist jeder, 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 wer es will, nur jung haben kein Badeit. Alte kennen, kennen, kennen euch sein Kinder und ein Eier. Freier Zeit. Wer es wog, holt um auf Decken, wer mit Restkeit stellt sein Fuß, brennt die Jugend, sei entgegen, von dem Ghetto Agerus. Jung ist jeder, 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 wer es will, nur Jürgen haben kein Badeit. Alte kennen, kennen, kennen euch sein Kinder von einer freier Zeit. Wir gedenken alle Sonnen, wir gedenken alle Freund. Ey, bequälme mir der Monen, unser Nächten mit dem Heind. Jung ist jeder, 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 wer es will, nur Jürgen haben. Kein Badeit, alte kennen, kennen, kennen euch sein Kinder von einer freier Zeit. Kleiben mir zu neu die Glieder, wieder stollen mir die Reihe. Geht der Bäuer, geht der Schmieder, lohn mir alle, geht mit sei. Weil jung ist jeder, 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 wer es will, nur jung haben kein Badeit. Alte kennen, kennen, kennen euch sein Kinder und ein Eier, Freier Zeit. The second song, which was written during the period of the ghetto, is the one that Alex mentioned, Das Elmte Kind, The Lonely Child. And um, I'll, I'll read a, a translation. They're chasing me, who? And leaving me no peace. Oh, mother, mommy, where are you? Your soil is looking for you. Your child is calling you. All through the field, the wind is howling and wailing. Daddy, not here. Who knows where he is? He was caught in a trap by a gruesome giant. Dark was the night that this happened. Still darker was my mother's face. The child lives in never resting day, unsettled night, anxious sleep. It thinks it hears, oh my child, and soon after its father's footsteps, its mother rocking it to sleep and singing this song. If one day you are a mother, you must tell your children of the hurt your father and mother were dealt by the enemy. Remember then the past and heed the present. Uh... 
Es jagt mich, wer jagt, und er lässt mich so ruhig. Oh, Mame, mein Mame, wo bist du wohl? Er sucht dir deine Sorelle, es ruft dir dein Kind. Es reuet und es jammert in Feld um der Wind. Er sucht dir deine Sorelle, es ruft dir deine Kind. Es reuet und es jammert in Feld um der Wind. Wer tat nicht doch, wer weiß, wo er ist, es hat ihm gefangen, ein gräusamer Ries. Die Nacht schwarz gewähnt ist, wenn in das ist geschehen. Nach schwarzer der Pannen, mein Mames gewähnt. Die Nacht schwarz gewähnt ist, wenn in das ist geschehen. Nach schwarzer der Pannen, meine Mames gewähnt. In der Wagen von Tod in der Wande von Nacht, in Umruf und Schlaf ist das Kind und es dacht. O Kind meins, sie hört Scheine von Taten getrieb. Die Mame verwegt dir und singt dir das Lied. O Kind meins, Sie hört Scheine von Taten getrieb. Die Mame verwegt dir und singt dir das Lied. Als du bist einmal am Mame sein, Sollst du deine Kinder der Zähnen pein? Was tat er, Mame, gehat dort von dem Feind? Der denkt euch dem Nächten, der Mann euch dem Heim. Was tat er, Mame, gehat dort von dem Feind? Gedenk euch dem Nächten, der Mann euch dem Heim. The next song, Ye du Partisana tells of the next chapter in the story when uh, Kaczerginski, along with fellow fighters from the Vereinigter Partisaner Organizatia, the FPO, went out into the, into the woods to fight. And um, by the way, there are recordings of Kaczerginski singing these songs. And the recording of Katja Ginsky singing this song was one that I incorporated into the film uh, when, when that chapter of, of history came up. From the ghetto's prison walls into the free forest, carrying a new rifle instead of chains. On the missions, my friend kisses me throat and shoulder. From this day forth, we are fast grown together. We are few in number, bold as millions, blowing up bridges and troop trains, 
The fascist trembles with fear, doesn't know where they're coming from, storming as if from under the ground, Jews, partisans. The word revenge has meaning when you write it in blood. Before the sacred dawn, we carry out our strikes. No, we will never be last of the Mohegans, bringing sunlight to the night, the Jew, the partisan. That word Mohegans in Yiddish is Mohikaner. <laughs> Listen to it. And th this is Schmelke Kaczerginski, you know, didn't have a high school education. But he, um, he spent a lot of time in the library. Und ich get das Twisse Wend in die Welt der Freie, anstatt Keiten auf die Hand, halt ab ich sein Eie. Auf die Aufgabe ist mein Freund, kuscht mir halt so nach. Mitten Bix bin ich von Hein, erst so neu gewachsen. Wenig sehnen mir in so Dreste wie Millionen, reißen mir auf Barg und Toll, bringen Echalonen. Der Faschist verzittert der, weiß nicht, wovon er warnen. Sturmen jeden wie unter er, jeden Partisaner. Das Wort bekomme hat der Sinn, wenn mit Blut verschreibst ihn, war dem heiligen Beginn, fieren mir die Streiten, nein, mir will nicht kein Moll sein, letzte Mohikaner. Sprengt der Nacht die Sonnenschein, der jeder Partisaner. Nein, mir will nicht kein Moll sein, letzte Mohikaner. Sprengt der Nacht die Sonnenschein, der jeder Partisaner. Early years after the war, Kaczerginski wrote maybe his best known song, Zolshein Kumindige Ule, Let Our Salvation Come. When you're feeling low, take a little drink. If sorrow persists, then let's sing a song. If there's no whiskey, we can drink water. Fresh water is life itself, and what more does a Jew need? Zolshen Kumindigi Ule, may our salvation come already. The Messiah will soon appear. It is a guilty generation. Do not be misled. But for the sinning, the, the Messiah will come the sooner. This is Jewish tradition. O oh, Lord above, we beseech you, you see that the Messiah doesn't come just a little bit too late. Abyssal et Zuspet. And the final verse, Stanzen Beimer in die the trees are dancing in the forest, stars are dancing on the sky, and Rabbi Yisrael, the, the Jewish people, the Mechutten, 
the in-law, is whirling in the middle of all of this. The Messiah will waken from his little nap when he hears our prayerful song. Gesolet auf den Herzen, macht mir alle Chaim, als der Ruhm mit Lust nicht ruhen, singen in ihrer Lied. Ist nicht doch ein bisschen Brom, lo mir trinken im Maien. Maien, Chaim ist doch Chaim. Was noch darf Solchene kommen die Geulde, Solchene kommen die Geulde, Solchene kommen die Geulde. Maschiach kommt scheine bald, Solchene kommen die Geulde, Soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, so schiach kommt scheine Bauch. Es hat dort von Kolechaien, seid nicht keine Ronnen, und nicht von den Sindiken, Moschiach, Gicher, kommen weg. Ach, du Tatele im Himmel, Späten bnei Rachmonen, Se Moschiach soll nicht kommen, Abyssale zu spät. Soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, Moschiach kommt scheine Malde, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, Soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, Moschiach kommt scheine Bauch. Es tanzen die Bäumer in die Wälder, Stern auf den Himmel, Rabbi Israel, der mir Chutten, Dreht sich in der Mitte. Sech sich auf Kappen, Moschiach, von sein tiefen Trimmel. Wie ein Erwetter, Herr, unser Twiele, dicke Lied. Soll scheine kommen, die Geholle, Soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll schein kommen die Geholle, Moschiach kommt scheine bald, hey, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll schein kommen die Geholle, Moschiach kommt scheine bald. Soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, Moschiach kommt scheine im Wald, hey, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, soll scheine kommen die Geholle, Moschiach kommt
Richmond on the Australian Cup. Uh, as fights move in, first of all, to hear the beautiful words from Aaron, from Alex, and from Sue, and the music by uh, Josh. I'm quite aware that, in case you don't know me, many of you, that you're not here to honor me, but you're to honor, here to honor those heroes that we talked about, uh, that are written about in the book. Uh, the tribute they really never got in their uh, lifetime. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna make a couple of remarks I'm not going to summarize the book. You've heard a lot about the content. I'm really going to talk about what the book meant to me and what drove me to spend six years digging up these ar rare archival sources in uh, Vilnius and Kiev and Moscow and Vilna and, of course, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv to pull together this uh, book. I'd like to start with a, a story, I think an interesting story. Back in May, I gave a lecture in Lviv. Lviv is the capital of Western Ukraine. On the paper brigade, on my book, with PowerPoint, basically a synopsis of the book. Of course, Lviv used to be Lemberg, a city with 100,000 Jews before the Holocaust. Now it's got about 2,000, just like Vilnius. The audience was young and intelligent and non-Jewish Ukrainians. And at the end, Sofia Diak, who is a phenomenal Ukrainian woman who directs the Lviv Center for Urban History. Um, she listened attentively as I described the book smuggling and the rescue of cultural treasures. And then she asked an interesting question, which was actually much more interesting than she realized. She, sa she said, I'm sure this story you've just told us is universally known in the Jewish community. I'm sure it's taught in schools and commemorated by plaques and public ceremonies. So can you tell me how your treatment of the paper brigade differs from that of earlier studies? <laughs> Do Jews in the diaspora and Israeli Jews interpret it differently, emphasize different parts? And I had to reply to her that this story is not very widely known among Jews, that mine is the first full-length book on the subject. There are no plaques. There are no commemorations to the heroes of the paper brigade. No differing interpretations and debates. And as I did that, her jaw dropped. I had talked about a lot of shocking, surprising, and amazing events in the talk, but that was the first time she had a strong facial reaction. It was a reaction of confusion and disbelief, as if to say, why is this story not part of your national history? And I really think we have to ask that question, and Aaron asked that question. Why <coughs> is this story only being told now, 70 years after the war? Why, after all, the Holocaust has been a prominent theme in American public culture for about 40 years. This book should have been written by somebody 30 years ago. I don't have one answer to that. But I agree with Aaron that we really have to consider whether our notion of heroism has been too narrow, too limited to armed resistance. I consider the paper brigade to be the equivalent of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in the annals of Jewish spirituals resistance. But the Warsaw Ghetto uprising is a household word, and the paper brigade is not, or at least not yet. And I hope this launches the beginning of a process of revisiting heroism and resistance. Because any time that someone risked his or her life for a noble cause that was larger than them, he or she was a hero. For mo that's one thought, second thought. For me, this story of rescue, retrieval, and transfer of cultural treasures, the cultural treasures of East European Jewry, it's not only a great historical event, but it's a metaphor. On one level, for me, it was a personal metaphor. I'm a historian. That's what I spend my time doing. I retrieve, interpret, and pass on the world of East European Jewry. East European Jews deserve to be remembered not only how they died, but also how they lived. But I think the story is a metaphor for something much bigger because it challenges all of us to do what we can 
to preserve, retrieve, and pass on the richness of Jewish culture. When it comes to Jewish culture, I am a conservative. The first imperative is to preserve, retrieve, and pass on. Jewish culture has endured such blows, such severe blows, genocide, modernization and assimilation, emigration and dislocation, that it is in danger of becoming a pale shadow of its former self. Of course, any vibrant culture, whether religious culture or secular culture, must have creativity and innovation, but they must take place on the firm foundation of inherited texts, of inherited songs, of knowledge, associations, and practices to preserve, to retrieve, to pass on. That is what the Yarmulk on my head means to me, a commitment to preserve and pass on, and that is why I speak to my children in Yiddish. I am struck by the image of Shmerke Kaczerginski, a Jewish communist, and Sutzkever, a secular poet, wrapping rabbinic texts and Hasidic texts around their torsos to smuggle them into the ghetto on their bodies risking their lives for historical records from the 18th century. They didn't say, I'm a modern Yiddish poet, so I'll rescue modern Yiddish poetry. But the rest, the older stuff, the religious stuff, is expendable. They understood that the rebuilding of Jewish life after the war would require the survival of all layers of Jewish heritage. A third thought. I'm also, like Jonathan, very aware of the multi-ethnic nature of this story. People devoted to arts and letters of various nationalities and traditions were united in a kind of brotherhood or sisterhood with shared sensibilities and values. I was struck by the non-Jewish Lithuanians and Poles who played a role in rescuing Jewish cultural treasures. Hermann Kruk handed one copy of his ghetto diary to a Catholic priest for safekeeping. And there were the rescuers on a Shemaitje Antanas Upis. My personal favorite was on a Shemaitje, a Lithuanian librarian at the Vilnius University Library, because she risked more, she suffered more, and she identified more with the Jews than anyone else. She hid not only Jewish books, she hid a Jewish child and she was awarded the title Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem in the 1960s. Shemaita was denounced by her neighbors for the crime of helping Jews. She was arrested, deported to Dachau and other concentration camps. But after the war, she lived in poverty in France. She was still obsessed with retrieving the Jewish treasures she had hidden in Vilnius. She wrote incessant letters to her friends in Lithuania with instructions where to find the material she had hidden. She writes these letters in 1957, 12 years after the war. She's still writing to friends in Vilnius. I hid it there, I hid it there, I hid it there. I also admired her life decisions. She refused to go back to Lithuania after the war because she was a staunch anti-communist. She couldn't find a place in the Lithuanian diaspora because she was a staunch anti-fascist. Instead, she actually decided to live in Israel for several years in the 1950s. But the same is true of Schmerke and Sutzkever. They rescued all kinds of cultural treasures, not only Jewish ones. They smuggled works by Gorky, by Tolstoy, the statu a bust of Tolstoy, a document signed by the Polish freedom fighter Tadeusz Kociuszko, and they delivered these treasures to their Polish and Lithuanian friends. They didn't try to settle accounts with the Polish resistance. The Polish resistance had refused to provide arms to the ghetto fighters, to the FBO in the ghetto, but they didn't decide to tit for tat that they would neglect endangered cultural treasures. So the generosity of spirit on both sides of the ghetto wall by Poles, Lithuanians, and Jews was for me inspiring. I was happy to work on a book that was to a large extent connected with YIVO, and it brought back many fine memories for me. You see, I've been connected with YIVO since I was six years old. My father, Zechroin Lavrocha, was a close disciple of Max Weinreichs, the 
great scholar and director of EVO, the man who rebuilt EVO in America and who retrieved its treasures from Germany. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, my father was a member of EVO's academic executive committee. So at age six, I started paying attention to the mail that came to our home address. And I noticed lots of envelopes of different sizes coming from 1048 Fifth Avenue. But the envelopes gave only the address. The envelopes didn't have a name of a person or an institution. Since I knew that Fifth Avenue was where the rich people live, I thought, or at least I hoped, that 1048 Fifth Avenue was the address of a bank. <laughs> and that inside the envelopes there were checks or bank statements. That's when my father explained to me that Evo was, what Evo was, and he told me that it had treasures much more precious than anything in a Fifth Avenue bank. I remember us spending a Passover Seder at Max and Regina Weinreichs. It was 1967, I think, a month after Max's brilliant son Uriel died of cancer. My dad was there as a kind of surrogate son instead of Uriel. My mom was nervous. She wanted me and my brothers to be on our best behavior because going to the Weinrach's house was a special occasion. In accordance with the tradition, I found the hidden matzah, the afikoman, so I was entitled to a present. So I went over and asked Max Weinreich for a chemistry set. <laughs> my parents were scandalized by my chutzpah. To ask a 75-year-old man, a world-famous professor, and someone who had just suffered the loss of his son to go buy a chemistry set. They were also upset that I, that I said the words chemistry set to Weinreich in English and not in Yiddish. But a week or two later, my father brought home a chemistry set from Yivo. Weinreich had gone to a department store and bought it himself. And ever since then, I've considered Weinrach to be a kind of spiritual grandfather figure, and Yivo kind of a second home. And that's why it's a special pleasure for me to thank Yivo, to thank Jonathan Brent, Eddie Portnoy, Robbie Newman, and Ludmila Sholochova for all the things they have done for me to make this book possible, and more broadly, for everything they are doing to make the Vilna collections uh, accessible and usable and to make them live, live on. Finally, there are a few people in the audience I want to acknowledge. First, I have to acknowledge my wife, Elisa Bemporad. She is and was my first and last reader, my best critic, and most of all, I'm grateful to her for the inspiration she is to me in my life. I'm lucky enough to wake up every morning, look at her, and feel stronger, because I know there is beauty and nobility in the world. <laughs> Second, and on a very different plane, I want to thank my agent, Scott <laughs> Mendel. No, but quite seriously. Scott gave me truly invaluable advice during the writing process of this book, which shocked me. I didn't think agents did that. I know something about agents because my wife's brother and my wife's father are agents, but not literary agents, they're textile agents. <laughs> they sell Italian textiles across the world. But I doubt that my father-in-law and brother-in-law ever go back to a manufacturer and give them advice on how to make a better sweater, right? But Scott patiently did exactly that. Third, I'd like to single out Samuel Norwich, Evo's director in the late 1980s and early 1990s when the materials in Lithuania were discovered because Sam spared no effort and energy to retrieve those materials and his devotion was truly a model that has stayed in my mind. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge my friend Michael Menken, or Misha. He was known back in Vilna, Misha Minkovich. 
Misha is the last living member of the Paper Brigade. He is now. Then you were the youngest, and now you are the oldest. Misha was 18. Misha was 18 when he worked in that brigade. And uh, friends with Shmer Kakachaginsky, who taught him, really, how to smuggle the books. Misha lost his mother, two sisters, and a brother in Ponar, but he never lost his humanity. Misha Dubista held. Nit no fadembos to eskiton far nidishen folk in the papier brigade. No euch du bist a held, mit dem was du as gat die keuches aufzubauen, as a schein leben da in Amerike noch dem Ochome. Und du bist a held, weil du as keim und nicht verloren dein Edelkeit, dein Gutharzigkeit und dein Menschlichkeit. I'd like to conclude with a wish, or maybe it's a blessing, um, modified on something Shmerke Kaczyginski said. Shmerke, in his last stage of life, he moved from Vilna to Poland, to Poland to Paris, pa stuck in Paris for three years. Eventually, he settled in Buenos Aires, where he became the director of the Congress for Jewish Culture in Argentina. Uh, and his arrival was a big event. This partisan, this ghetto fighter, this uh, poet, well-known figure, arrives to revive Jewish culture in Argentina. And there was a press conference uh, a, a day or two after his arrival. And he uh, blessed the community, saying, may you, the Jewish community of Buenos Aires, shine with the light of holy devotion to Jewish culture, just as we the brigade of 40 writers, educators, and cultural activists did in the Vilna Ghetto. So that's my wish to all of us. May we, the Jewish community of America, shine with the light of holy devotion to Jewish culture, just as they, the brigade of 40 writers, educators, and cultural activists did in the Vilna Ghetto. Thank you.